put somebody who's brand new into a situation where they have no business doing that level of intensity or that level of training, um, volume or load or whatever, they're going to figure out how to survive because that's what our bodies do. They might interpret that survival as progress, but the problem is that that survival eventually has it stops. They they can't they can't muster up the physiological capabilities to keep surviving, and they start to get beat up. And along the way, they didn't make progress. Their body wasn't favorably adapting; it was simply just surviving. Becoming a highly decorated athlete requires so much more than vigorous hours at the gym. It also requires the perfect balance of good nutrition, a growth mindset, and a constant drive to be better and do better. Today we have someone exemplary with us. He so perfectly balances the job of being a good coach, a professional athlete, a six times games professional athlete at the CrossFit Games, and also most importantly being a good father. He's someone I've personally admired for as long as I can remember, which is why I'm absolutely over the moon to have Mr. Marcus Felijo with us today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here today. It's totally my pleasure, and、um, I really do appreciate the kind words that you just shared in your introduction. <laughs> absolutely. So let's just ju- ram- jump right into it, Mr. Philly. You've had such an interesting background—a 4.0 GPA in college. You've been a Division One athlete. You've gone to med school, competed multiple times at the CrossFit Games, and now run various businesses. What has this entire journey been like this for you? Well, it's certainly been a、um, a one singular focus at a time type of journey for me.、Uh, most of my life, up until most recently, has been、um, I have one thing in front of me that I get to pour my energy and my、uh, passion towards, and that's what made me excel. If it was school,、um, university, medical school, becoming an athlete,、um, all of those things were very、uh, I mean, yes, I I was always doing a number of things concurrently, but I was able to kind of pour a lot of energy into one thing at a time, and、um, and now I feel as though I have many things on my on my plate that I want to pour energy into, and it's you know it's presenting some of the newest challenges in my life, which is、uh, how do I concurrently be a good athlete, be a good father, be a good business owner, be a good coach,、um, and they all demand a lot of different things. When I was in my twenties, I could. I could just be a student, or I could just focus on trying to make it to the CrossFit Games and and keep the other things at a minimum in terms of responsibilities and and pressures. Absolutely,、um, that's such a wonderful answer. And I think for a very long time there was this notion that the CrossFit camp seemed to be somewhat at a metaphorical war with the world of bodybuilding. However, somewhere along the line, I think you really brought functional bodybuilding to the limelight. What exactly is functional bodybuilding for our viewers, and why does it, in your words, help you look good and move well?、Um, yeah, I think that I, because I came from a,、um, well, let me let me put it this way: a lot of people who found CrossFit found CrossFit and maybe for the first time in their lives experienced real fitness, what they considered success, like <clears throat> a training regimen. And an approach and a community and something that got them excited about being consistent with their health and fitness.、Um, plus, they saw results. So, whatever they had done prior to that was sort of looked down upon. And because so many people have、um, not been able to navigate the globo gym world very well successfully, they go in. They They do a few routines. They jump on machines here and there. It's it's kind of a misguided culture. There's not a culture of dedication、um, so much anymore. There's a culture of just sort of like I go into the gym and just do it because I I, I have to do it. There's a lot of you know s- long slow duration cardio,、um, not not a lot of coaching. So if that's the culture people came from, and they labeled it bodybuilding, and then now they go to CrossFit. There's a better community. There's a better culture. There's a culture of working hard. There's a methodology. There's more weight training. There's more things that are effective. 
that they're getting exposed to, they suddenly start to have success. It's very easy to look back and just be like, well, the bodybuilding thing was wrong. It was broken. It had so many flaws to it. However, if you ask somebody like me or, you know, a, a pretty sizable population out there that had success in the bodybuilding world before they ever found CrossFit, we would say, that's not broken. It was actually great. I had a great experience doing my bodybuilding days, my Globo Gym days. I came up in the Globo Gym. I spent 10 years of my life, you know, doing routines and getting strong and building a good physique before I ever found CrossFit. So those of us who had success prior to it, I think I was certainly in the camp of, I can't be at a war with bodybuilding. Like I understand that there are some things about CrossFit that are a very unique and different. Um, and it has, if anything, expanded my view of fitness, but by no means does it negate the last 10 to 12 years of my life where I was actually doing fitness fairly successfully and learning and making, you know, good growth and improvement. So while I went down the very, very deep rabbit hole of CrossFit for about, about a decade, um, everything from being a, an affiliate member to a, a coach, to a business owner, to a CrossFit athlete, to a games athlete, um, I never lost sight of just like this, this positive association I had with bodybuilding. And actually the further I got down the competitive route of competitive fitness, competitive CrossFit, the more I longed for those days where it wasn't so much pressure. It wasn't so much intensity. It wasn't so much about performing in the gym. It was just about going and feeling a pump and feeling good. And that was what ultimately called me back towards that way of training and that way of thinking about my fitness and really finding a hybrid between the two. What were the elements of growing up training in the Globo gym, doing straight sets of 10 on the bench press, then going to the incline press, then going to the decline dumbbells, then going to the chest fly machine. Like people might laugh at that, but that felt great. And that was a Wednesday and that felt awesome. And I walked out of the gym with blood that was kind of pooled in my chest muscles and I felt pumped and I felt confident and I didn't want to go take a nap. And I didn't worry that the person next to me bench pressed more than me. And I didn't care that I didn't have a time to show for my workout. I just felt good. And it motivated me to have good nutrition choices. So those were not, those weren't problems. That is not the problem. And, and even CrossFit founders and people that, you know, started the movement, they wouldn't say that was the problem. The problem was people sitting on the couch. So creating this like distaste or this, this battle, this war against the bodybuilding world just seems silly to me. And, and ultimately I felt like there was a way to put, put the pieces together in a way that felt really good. I didn't want to say no or goodbye to snatching and clean and jerk. I just, wanted a little bit more balance. And that, that really is how functional bodybuilding came sort of came to be. Um, there's a lot more to the story that uh, is less important than that fundamental principle. I think that's such a wonderfully honest answer. And it's such an unbiased answer regarding both CrossFit and bodybuilding. But you mentioned low and sl slow and long cardio. Speaking of which, mm -hmm. I think for a very long time, we were conditioned to believe that more is always better. That, And today we know that it's far from the truth. How can anyone, whether it's an elite athlete or someone from the general population, determine the optimal training volume for themselves to avoid overtraining? And as you say, how can someone work towards being built, not burnt? Great question. <clears throat> um, well, I think... Uh, I think where I've arrived today is when I work with somebody or when I'm trying to coach somebody, you know, the, and they have specific goals. I think what we should all be striving for as coaches is to provide them with the minimal effective dose to get their goals met. Um, now, what, what, how do you even approach that? Well, you got to start small and then you build from there. 
Now, the problem that I see or one of the challenges of the CrossFit, you know, model or any other high intensity group fitness model, or even just like training models out there is that they'll bring people in that are relatively new and they hit them with something that's very, very difficult. And so our bodies just are great at surviving and um, essentially adapting under stress or, or more just like it's survival mechanism. So you put somebody who's brand new into a situation where they have no business doing that level of intensity or that level of training um, volume or load or whatever, they're going to figure out how to survive because that's what our bodies do. They might interpret that survival as progress, but the problem is that that survival eventually has, it stops. They, they can't, they can't muster up the physiological capabilities to keep surviving and they start to get beat up. And along the way, they didn't make progress. Their body wasn't favorably adapting. It was simply just surviving. So it's a mindset to begin with. It's a mindset of, I don't need to do a lot. I just need to do a little bit to change, to move things in the right direction. And that's, that's a big, like, there's a marketing aspect to that in, uh, in advertisement and, and just fitness culture. We are, a lot of people are selling like, Hey, you gotta, let's do all this stuff really hard and fast. So we get there quickly versus let's do something, you know, easy and achievable that you could do for the next 20 years and we'll make slow and steady progress along the way. It's a little bit difficult to get people on board with that second concept um, because they've been fed the other concept so much. Take this pill, we're going to be good to go. I think what's maybe challenging people about this pandemic is to, to sort of switch to another topic that's related is that People are in denial about the fact that this thing is going to last and take as long as it's going to take. We don't have like modern medicine and science cannot overnight create a pill to fix this problem. Even the vaccines that are being developed worldwide, when they are, if, and when they are approved and ready to be administered in large, you know, doses, to, I mean, in, you know, doses to a large population, even then it will still take, quite some time for this virus to diminish and slow and then be eradicated. So people want to get that quick fix. And when I uh, talk to people about being built, not burnt, you know, I have to say, we have to look at some historical timeline of their life where they've fallen victim to that. Mm -hmm. If they have never fallen victim to it, they're not a good candidate to try and sell this message to because they'll be like, I don't, uh, you know, they might logically be able to get there, but most likely they won't. But somebody who's fallen victim to it will understand like, okay, I, I was doing really well for a period of time and then I got burnt out and injured and I stopped, but then I had to restart all over again. And I was doing really well for a period of time and then I got burnt out and got injured and I had to stop and I restart again. And if you like, if you map out the timeline, okay, two years has gone by where you've had three periods of time where you were doing well and three periods of time where you're doing really bad. And the net result is that you're essentially in the same place you were two years ago when you started. Mm -hmm. So then you say, okay, what if we had just sort of taken it a little differently, a different approach? What if instead of getting those great results that you got in three months to drop 20 pounds, what if we did it like this? You know, and that that can certainly begin to start opening people's eyes to the potential that there's another way. And one final thing is that if somebody has really hit the low, low, low points that people have hit from trying to push it too hard and too fast, then they will understand they don't ever want to feel that again, right? If you've really been burnt out, if you've really been injured, if you've really gotten it bad, then you'll be like, I don't want to go back there. Mm -hmm. Now, a, a human, you know, memory for pain and suffering is actually relatively short. Mm -hmm. So if you've, if I, if I overtrained for, you know, six months, had a catastrophic injury that took me out of the gym for six months and I finally got back to training and then 
I start to feel good again. You know, maybe three or four months later, I forgot that I ever overtrained. And I'm like, oh, let's do it again, right? So it's, it requires coming back to the concept periodically. It definitely requires having a coach or an influential person out there speaking the message repeatedly to people. Um, so I find myself being in that position and our coaches for our business being in that position to remind people, kind of rein them back in. You got your people that need to be reined in and then you got your people that need to be motivated to get moving off the couch. And both of them are just as susceptible to, you know, falling victim to, to failure or stall, stall in progress or plateaus. I can completely resonate with that. As I mentioned to you earlier, I've been that person who's thought more is better or that I need to burn myself to the ground every single day to move effectively. And of course, I landed up injured. I started to hate training. I resented going to the gym. And I think um, it was doing the Waken Training series by Revival Strength that really helped me reframe my approach to fitness. I think the small notes you left behind at the end of every day saying, don't do it if your body's not demanding it and listen to your body. It was vital to helping me shift my approach to it. And I can't think, help but think of this, but every time I watch a sport, I think about how taxing it is, both physically and mentally, to be an elite athlete. Individuals like you have mastered their craft, but what is it that you do differently to reach peak performance? Is it talent? Is it technical skills? Natural athleticism or something else? Hmm. Well, it's, um, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I have certainly been there at times in my life. I, I don't consider myself currently to be, you know, an elite performer. Um, I've got, I've put the repetitions in over my career to uh, have, have the skill set to do stuff that many would consider high level or, or even elite. Um, but knowing where I've been at the top of my game and knowing where I'm at today, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty far, far, far stones throw from, from that. Um, what it took to get there is uh, this unwavering sort of uh, commitment to just the work, right? Uh, people that are really successful and reach high levels of sport, they ultimately have to become, they just like get connected to this idea of like, I just going to do the work and I'm going to do it every, you know, every day that I'm supposed to without fail. And I'm going to work hard and then I'm just going to walk away and I'm not going to let, you know, my emotions and my mental space like dwell on it. It's just like, it's, it's like unattached discipline and commitment. Um, they care, but they don't care so much that they spend all day thinking about whether they did it right or did it wrong. Those are like elite performers. And then uh, the next layer to that is that you have to do enough repetitions to, to get there. I, I don't care if you're naturally gifted or not, you got to do the repetitions. So even people that are genetically gifted or, you know, even people that take like performance enhancers, you still have to do the repetitions. So yeah, some people can get an advantage by, how, you know, based upon, how, you know, they were born with the right arm length, leg length, you know, limb length, whatever, to be good at the sport. Um, you know, Michael Jordan was the right size to be a, an effective basketball player. He could jump very well. He had great tendon strength but he still had to put in the reps. Like there's no way around that. So how do you put in the reps? Well, you, you have to, you have to want it and desire it, but you also have to set yourself up in your life to be able to do it most optimally every day. And that's being disciplined outside of the gym or outside of the, off the court or off the field, whatever sport you're playing. And, you know, those people that are, um, you know, they're prioritizing that in their life. They go to bed early, you know, they sleep enough, they care about their nutrition, they hydrate well, they have good relationships in their life, not toxic relationships in their life. These are the people that are going to win. And now you could say, well, you look at somebody like, uh, 
<laughs> I'm using all these um, Chicago Bulls references, but like, you know, Dennis Rodman, you know, he was this, because uh, the documentary had just kind of come out on Netflix. I just watched it about their basketball team. Dennis Rodman was out partying all night, right? Um, and he wasn't taking it seriously outside the gym. So he wasn't, how is he such an elite performer? And it's, it's, it's really, you know, that, that's a very personal thing for every person. You know, Dennis Rodman had put in years of discipline, years of being straight edge. And towards the end of his career, he was really, you know, craving an identity that wasn't this, this other guy. He wanted to go and explore things that made him, that excited him. It, it, you know, and so in, in a sense, he needed that to be his best and to want to come back and be consistent to do the repetitions. If he didn't go out and party, if he didn't go out and do the drugs, then he wouldn't have wanted to be in the gym the next day working hard, you know? So I don't know. It was a very long winded answer, but um, when I was in my peak of CrossFit, everything revolved around that next day of training. I thought about it every night before bed. It was the first thing I thought about when I woke up. I thought about the repetitions. I ate the meals perfectly. You know, I was just dedicated to it. And that was what, and I loved it. And I didn't, I didn't think of doing it any other way. Wow. Thank you for sharing that with me. And I think it just sounds like it can pose somewhat of a burden on someone's emotional health. And it's not just a sport by itself, but there's also rejection on the day of competition. There's also negativity, negativity on the internet. So how did you deal with that? How do you keep moving forward despite this adversity that comes your way? Yeah, that, that's tricky. Um, in particular in this age of like social media, there's a, uh, it's very difficult to protect yourself from all of the stuff that's being put, you know, I don't know, that's out there. I know that in, in sort of the early years of CrossFit, Instagram was really kind of, for me, it's, uh, early years of CrossFit competition, the Instagram was really taken off and every day I could just see, you know, my opponents, uh, posting, you know, their highlight reel. <laughs> and I, I kind of subscribed to posting every day of training and I, whether it was good or bad, I just posted it all. But, you know, when you see a bunch of people's highlight reels, you can get this false sense of like, man, everyone is just doing so great and how I can't keep up. And that was tough for a while. Um, I didn't know how to navigate that in particular, particularly well. Uh, the years of training and the years of competing and the years of knowing many of these elite competitors and what really goes on behind the scenes has taught me enough to know that everyone's not having great days every day. <laughs> everyone's struggling 90% of the time to just make progress. And then 10% of the time they are hitting PRs and they're posting that on the internet. Um, staying focused on, on what I was about was uh, came back to sort of the purpose for the whole thing in the beginning. Right. I, I did CrossFit as a competitive sport at a time, I think at, at, at the best time, because it was the, the sport had evolved enough to become like a worldwide, uh, on a worldwide stage where the competition level was high and the games had evolved to the format of like, you know, the four day format where it was this really diverse competition. So I got to experience that, but it was before the sport was like pro status where people were getting paid a lot of money, where there were a lot of endorsements. You know, I was the 12th fittest on the, on earth. I think I made like $8,000 for that, you know, placement or, you know, which is not small amount of money, but it's not like, it's nothing compared to what guys can make today. I mean, guys can win $8,000 on an event if they go to the big, the big events, you know, and um, there weren't a lot of endorsements. So, you know, for something that requires so much time and energy, there, there had to be a reason for it that was bigger than just the outcome and a, bigger than just the podium. It was, and for me, it was discovering who I was as an individual, as a person facing my fears, um, which there were many fears that I faced in training and in competition. Um, and that certainly kept me motivated and in, in going and that, you know, it helped to quiet the noise that was out there. Cause it was like, I, at the end of the day, I didn't, it wasn't even really about beating my components, I mean, my opponents. It was about beating the, it was about, it was about 
achieving the best performance I knew I was capable of. And the, the biggest obstacle to that was just my own brain. And that was it. So I was like, okay, how do I conquer this brain? <laughs> you know, if I'm in an Instagram battle with my brain, that's, that's really what the, the, the battle is. It's not about which those other people that are posting stuff online and saying positive or negative comments, that's just making the brain work harder. It's, it's sort of igniting that, that same uh, challenge and obstacle that I was trying to overcome to begin with. So in the end, of, at the end, I, I welcomed it. I was like, okay, this is part of it. How do I overcome this? Because that's really what I'm, why I'm doing this whole thing in the beginning. I think you always have such a holistic view to health and fitness and all of it, just with the physical, emotional, mental, and existential aspects of it. But what about nutrition? What is your philosophy on it? And what does an average day of eating look like for you? Uh, well, this is, you know, the quality of my food is what I try and put first. Um, the uh, How I consume the food is, how you know, kind of up there in the first tier of what I like to focus on. So is it real food? Is it whole foods? Is it minimally processed? Am I cooking it myself? You know, am I, am I sitting down to eat it? Am I having balanced meals? Am I chewing my food? Um, those things start, I always start with. Um, I definitely think that having an understanding of the quantity of your food uh, and the quantity that makes you feel best and look the best and is important for people to understand. I don't believe every single person has to calculate all the numbers down to the exact gram. For some people, that's a, that's helpful and impactful for a period of time. And, and for others, they just need to get an understanding generally of what they need. A handful of this, you know, two fistfuls of that, you know, a half a plate of vegetables, right? Like those can work. Um, and then, so it's just, that's, that's kind of it. That's my philosophy. It's just consistency around those principles. And, you know, if I, I cook, if I look at the last year and, you know, we do some quick math, I have, let's say three meals a day, 21 meals a week, 50 weeks out of the year, a thousand meals a year of those thousand I've cooked and prepared 960 to 970 of those myself. There were 30 that I ate out, 40 that I ate out. Some people might call that like deprivation, but it's like, yeah, once a week I eat out, you know, or once a week I have a meal, you know, that's special. It's more like every two weeks. And so just that consistency is what I get my, that's how I get my success. I think being in control of your meals and just knowing what's going into your meals is so important in this day and age because sometimes we go out to buy a granola bar only to, to find out it contains more sugar than a bar of chocolate. So I think uh, just basically being in control of knowing what's going into your meals is a starting step for nutrition. And right now, while the majority of the world remains constrained within the four walls of their home, um, most people are being more intentional about their health because they have a fear of falling sick. So what would you recommend to anyone watching who's at home, has minimal to no equipment, and still wants to look good and move well? Oh, I, I, would, I would just say that, you know, they should start every single day or make room every single day to just do something. I don't care if it's a lot or a little. Um, it could be as little as three minutes of movement you know, drop down, do 10 push-ups, do 10 sit-ups, do 10 squats, two sets and call it a day. But it, it's, it's creating that pattern and that rhythm of movement each day. We should move every single day. Should we train hard and try and, you know, make incredible uh, strides in our fitness every day? Not necessarily. But movement is movement and you got to have it. And if you're certainly if you're confined to the four walls of your apartment or your home and you can't really get out and do as much as you'd like to be doing or you're feeling a little bit of the emotional strain of that, getting your body to move that that moves energy. That's a life force for you. So it's super important. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Philly. This has been such a great and insightful interview. I know I've learned a bunch from this and I'm pretty sure everyone else will too. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me and I'm having an absolute fangirl moment right here in case <laughs> anyone can't tell. So, <laughs> This has been great. I love your questions and thank you for, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Philly.